Um, so next in line, and last but not the least, we have Santosh from FMG. He will be taking us through MindMax, and that title of the presentation is A Powerful Tool to Unlock Potential Value. So Santosh works at Fortescue Metals in, in the CBD office, and Fortescue was established by the founder and chairman, Dr. Andrew Forrest, in 2003. It exports about 175 to 180 million tonnes of iron ore annually. Their commitment to technology and innovation ensures they remain one of the world's lowest cost iron ore producer. Fortescue wholly owned and fully integrated operations in Pilbara include Chichester and Solomon Mining Hubs. They are developing the Western Hub home to the new Eliwana mine, the iron ore bridge magnetite project, an industry leader in cost and energy efficiency, will be one of the highest grade magnetite projects in the world. Santosh is a mining engineer with 16 years of experience in open pit mining and consulting. He's currently working at FMG and responsible for long-term planning, medium-term planning and designs for Iron, Iron Bridge Project. It is my pleasure to welcome Santosh for a powerful tool to unlock potential value. Please welcome Santosh for a powerful tool to unlock potential value. Santosh. <laughs> Thanks, Ashton. Thanks for that introduction. Well, um, first of all, thanks to Dada Mine and my, uh, uh, FM for giving me an opportunity to come and speak here, share my experience here. Um, well, um, my presentation is a little bit generic in like nature, sort of like more around my experience of using different tools of data mine and uh, a little bit about a case study of an iron ore project. So um, in terms of, of my exposure to data mine, uh, pretty much I've used uh, all three products. Um, NPV scheduler I've used initially for about two to three years, back in 2008, I think, roughly. Um, but there is like briefly for uh, for a couple of years. Uh, Studio P, um, I used it for about nine years, I think. Approximately and pretty much used it till 2018. Um, it's I think pretty much everyone knows like the capability of the software. In terms of like it's uh, what I liked in the software is it's pretty similar to how other GMP packages work, like the CAD packages for mining. A couple of good things about data mine that I found like when I was working as a consultant is its ability to model the uh, overloss and dilution in complex uh, sort of uh, mining scenarios. Like you have narrow way in mining where you're trying to like allow for some sort of dilution and no loss and um, usually you sort of say like five to ten percentage it's sort of small like thumbs up in most cases but uh, here is a tool that sort of allows you to like uh, apply the right sort of dilution skin or O loss based on what you think is more practical for that operation based on the assembly and the equipment that you've chosen for that particular operation um, another thing is I think a lot of people spoke about this is the dynamic pit designing tool um, we have had a lot of presentation on that. I'll skip on that. So um, MindMax I've been using for about nine years now. I think um, my first project was back in 2012. That that was a like a sort of conventional deep uh, gold deposit um, extending about 250 to 3 meter depth, if I remember. Um, there's one thing that, about that project. This is my first project as well, and it was just in a sort of getting introduced to the strategy planning space. Um, so very interesting like we had a sort of um, you know trade-off study for trolleyses for mine haulage pretty much like trolleyses conventional truck truck and shovel and the, and with the belt and weighing option so that is my first project that's quite impressive the interface was a little bit different back then it was more generic and like um, not as like as user friendly or all as intuitive as it is now it's come a long way in that sense um, so in my current role, I work for FMG as Ashton introduced. Um, we do use it a lot for most of the life of mine plans, reserve planning, and things like that. Um, just before I joined, we did a lot of like uh, 
high level uh, sort of scenario evaluation business case in a sort of uh, option evaluation. Um, past that, I did a little bit of work on in answering some of the strategic questions asked by the management about like what do you do, like what what can you do in this current market? Can we is it a good idea to sort of go for higher production as opposed to what we have planned so far in the operation? And like a few things about certain certain aspects of mining, like extended mine life. Usually, like in I know you look at the deposit and you sort of uh, plan for either anywhere between 20 to 25 years, unless your uh, deposit you know, base is huge. So, if you anyone who is looking to mine around 100 plus million tons per annum, would try to like uh, keep the mine life. In my experience, between 20 to 25 for the selected set of deposits, and they keep replacing it. So, um. There are a few things I looked at on that, like trying to speed up the operation and then trying to like uh, use more like a long-term um, optimistic price I would put in and look for bigger shells and try and see like if there is a case where you can um, sort of go at the same rate, but then keep the mind, extend the mind life by another 10 or 15 years. So those sort of strategic evaluations are completed um, or worked on in FMG, but I would say like, uh, Bulk of my experience is coming from um, AMC when I was working as a consultant over there. Uh, there are a lot of people here who have worked in AMC and I worked with a lot of them. Um, so MindMax, like um, in terms of tool, I look at it as Excel uh, for an engineer or an accountant, like you can pretty much use it for any sort of deposit. Like it's, it's in the creativity of the user and the experience of the user that if he's able to like, see the problem and formulate the problem, we can pretty much use MindMax, except for the underground operation, where it is somewhat different, completely different. So commodity-wise, I pretty much covered everything other than coal, if I can remember, and maybe mineral sense is something that I've touched on, haven't touched on. A um, lot of like different sort of projects, like uh, trade-offs, a lot of trade-offs, uh, trade-off sort of studies, and multi-bit optimization, some complex INO projects, complex in a sort of rare earths, potash, you know, Different commodities like uh, um, so. There was one thing that I like. I would like to share here is about the um, combined open pit underground optimization. I found this one was pretty interesting and um, pretty innovative as well. I'm not sure like if anyone has used a tool to do both things together. Um, it's pretty interesting in the sense like uh, that we had a deposit. Um, if I can recollect properly, I think it's a it's a gold one. Um, there was like um. Obviously, like you will go through the optimization, pit optimization to understand what it holds as an open pit project for the company. And then sometimes you will have opportunity to go underground based on your deposit. So you might have like sort of a bulk um, in a sort of deeply slipping old body, but at, and at some point it becomes completely uneconomical to go ahead with open pit mining. So this is one of those projects where we um, looked at the optimization, pit optimization, all the pre preparation work called strategic planning. And we pretty much like uh, what we saw that there was an opportunity to go underground from one of the initial pits, um, one of the initial stages from the open pit mine. So we took it up and then uh, we had the underground planning team, capa underground capability now in the consulting business and uh, underground guys sort of you know, looked at multiple scenarios um, based on their in a shape optimizer and some of those technical aspects and um, we like as an open pit team we received a couple of multiple options for underground schedules so essentially the concept was to plug in the underground schedule or all those scenarios as create multiple projects of MindMax and plug in all those scenarios into those projects and then use the open pit inventory with the pushbacks you have gone ahead with and basically like uh, um, you know, answer questions about like what you do with the open pit in terms of so where do you start? How do you start at? What is the rate, best rate for this particular, this sort of a deposit based on your capability to expand money on the project? And at the same time, you sort of trying to find out like, uh, hey, God, here I've got a stage, small pit from where I can get access to the underground mine. And underground mine, so in, so in terms of grade, it looks pretty lucrative most of the time. Obviously, there is a capital component to it, but this the, the idea of this project was to like put the capital component in there for the underground. And makes the make the tool work in a way that it sort of determines what is the right time to introduce the underground mine, considering the capital for underground, and also the questions regarding, like you have a plan for the business in terms of how much gold you want to produce, and you have a capital expenditure limit as well. So looking at all that, you sort of you can 
there are opportunities to sort of um, go at different rates for open pit and then fit the underground. So use the under, open underground schedule and then fit the open pit around the underground. And then sort of you know, determine, yes, yeah, year three is the time we will start introducing the underground or whatever that may be. And for different underground schedules, it might be different. So it was quite innovative. Um, it took a little bit longer for that. Uh, I'll jump on to the case study here. Yeah, this is um, this will probably look pretty similar to most of the INO projects across um, WA at least, and even across the globe. I think it is pretty similar in how it looks when you look at an INO project. So this is definitely not FMG, a different one. Uh, this is again from my consolidating experience. Um, so like in terms of, I tr try to condense everything in one slide so that people get the whole picture of how the project, what the project description is, what the project looked like. So basically we are looking at this INO project where um, the target was over 100 million tons per annum of INO production, hematite operation. And the project had about four uh, you know, spatially separated house. So if I remember, I think it was from one end to the other end, it was probably a couple of hundred or 300 kilometers apart. So some of them are closer to each other and if you look at the extreme ones, they're like 200, 300 kilometers away. Um, just to give a bit of context about the deposit and the number of pits, um, stockpiles, you can see there like multiple hubs. Most of them are flat deposits, roughly about 60 meter deep, uh, except a couple of them, which are like conventional sort of typical gold sort of deposit, deeply deep over bodies, 250, 300 meter deep, slightly higher-ish sort of uh, strip ratio. The rest of them were, were all pretty like low strip ratio, shallow sort of over bodies. So um, the project, so a few things were like fixed from the client, like uh, there were guidelines about how they want to go ahead with the um, construction of the plants, construction of what is their thinking behind the logistics, port. Uh, product is something that was uh, like a fluid at the moment when we are like given this project. There, were, there was a little bit of guidance on the product, what they want to um, definitely consider as a product considering the market dynamics. Other than that, it was pretty fluid for us to decide. So, in terms of plan, if you look at it, like um, it's, I mean, this is pretty much how I, how we sort of set up MindMax as well. All the hubs, you map all the hubs, and then you've got different for each of the hubs. You have a plan, dry plan, one beneficiation plan uh, for one of the hubs, and uh, the question, the management question or the strategy question here is obviously, you have 100 million tons to be produced from all these hubs. But you don't know like how much you produce from each of them. So that's the kind of question that we try to answer here. So how it was modeled was we had each plant had a, a sort of alternative capacity expansion options. For each capacity ex expansion, there was a capital attached to it. So in a way, like you're trying to say, like I start um, I start optimizing the plant, and here we go, like hub one, I'm going to go for a uh, 20 million tons plant, and hub two, I'm going to go for something like 50 because the deposit sort of supports that or there's more inventory in there. Um, so those questions like you literally can't answer with the help of a normal um, planning tool or even Excel, like it's, it's not that easy like in the context of considering products and everything. So um, that was there in the processing, that was one of the key um, key drivers to the project, I would say. Uh, there's a few options regarding train and ro road. Um, I'm not entirely sure about like all the hubs. I think for most of them, for most of them, it was like uh, the client was pretty, you know, sort of comfortable to go go with one of the options. There was no not many options given to us, but for, we did have a couple of hubs where we had to sort of decide and let the uh, sort of um, the company know that this is the best option based on the schedule outcome or the strategic planning outcome. For there's no complexity; it is simple. You uh, you you sort of take, you carry it to the port and then sort of sell from there. Um, in terms of products, like um, the approach was to go with a few product options, obviously. Set the uh, sort of base uh, specification for FP alumina silica, alumina plus silica, phos, sulfur. And there was a little bit of variation in there. Like each product, we had a penalty model applied. So what it does is like, you, even though you're trying to say that, okay, have got high grade, medium grade to simplify, high, medium, and low grade, you can still play with silica and alumina based on what you have in the ground. At the end of the day, you can only make what you have in the ground using what you have in the ground rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. So here, it had three products where um, 
the product specification is allowed to go a little bit up and down based on upper and low, lower bound for that particular product. So um, if you look at it, like if you look at the slide in terms of um, addressing the key drivers of the project, um, any strategic planning exercise, first thing you would look at is usually like in most of the deep deposits, you would go through pit optimization. Uh, you would look at the inventory, you look at great initials, and you do a lot of these things prior to getting prior to getting into MindMax so that you have a clear understanding of what you're dealing with. So, um, so the price was definitely the key driver. This is this being the Dino project. And the product mix, I would say, is number there, number one up there and there uh, in terms of the deciding factor for the project. Uh, planned capital, another big driver, like you, you don't want to be spending too much upfront um, in some hub where you're not going to get what you're like going to mine. So these questions, obviously, if you answer them, you're pretty much there in terms of getting the strategy right. Obviously, it's not as simple as I'm saying. Like it's just a lot of work involved in getting it, um, getting the output, and then analyzing the output and making sure that it makes sense in terms of practicality. So a few. This pretty much covers the key drivers for the project. But um, so obviously, this is the preparation for part that I sort of skipped through. Like you, you've got to go through bit optimization to get some guidance on the pushbacks and then you so the bit design is one thing that we we would skip through like in the past but now that we have a tool that can generate the bit designs as well there are some like there may be some opportunities going forward like if you start using that tool to produce bit designs rather than the um rather than some shapes from bit optimization too so obviously there's bit optimization and then um part of this in the job was to get the cycle times so the approach was to have cycle time coded in the model, and it works on the centroid basis. It's not accurate, but but it's there within plus or minus five to ten percentage. Given the um, sensitivity of this project to mining cost and the um, in a truck of mining fleet, it's not it's not a big uh, deal breaker in terms of looking at it, putting the right amount of data. there. Uh, great Tanishka, like obviously, like um, if you need to know like what you have in the de deposit in the ground. You need to understand your deposit. Uh, that is like understand. Do you have a deposit? Do you have a whole body where uh, alumina is lower and the rest of the things are different? As an example, or do you have something in there that is that might be high in silica but re relatively low for alumina? So you could use that to your advantage when you're trying to plan product and make the be best product mix for the market. Um, so product mix and scripts for that is um, in there. So um, so apart from the key drivers, I think there's a lot of value that you can unlock uh, by looking at the at mining itself. There's not a lot of drivers that is not a lot of levers you can pull in terms of mining, but still, it's, it's not to say there's, there's nothing. So you can still look at the pushbacks as one of the key drivers when you come to mining, and you, you can also look at in a stockpiles the material winning or the stockpiles how you create them. And how you sort of how you have understood the deposit and where is what. So if you if you cut it correctly, if you cut the aggregates correctly, then you will get the right uh, sort of optimum answer. So here, sort of the approach was to approach was to come up with a come up with multiple scenarios for um, pushbacks. Literally, like um, you have the fit optimization shells. Back then, this is how we did. Uh, looked at all the outcomes. Obviously, you would look for the step changes to identify where the obvious sort of natural fits are or the stages are. Then you build from that. Having said that, um, if you have 80 odd fits, then you can make one of the fits smaller here and another fit somewhere 100 kilometers of a slighter figure. Only that could be a variation where you can go for a smaller fit in this extreme and then go for a larger fit here. So, so if you look at it in, in terms of permutation and combination, it's like. Um, Million. Like you can't, you can't imagine. Like you can, you can keep on doing this exercise. But at least for the sake of like um, understanding, at least like to understand what sort of impact it might have on the overall project value. It could be like a percentage or two percentage, or it could be as high as five percentage. You don't know. Like until you, until you're gone through the exercise, and also depends on the skills of the engineer in selecting the pits. It's very subjective to me. Um, it's not backed by the schedule, it's backed by the inventory and the pit optimization revenue values that you use. So a lot of lot of subjectivity there. So the only way to address these sort of uh, you know sort of difficult questions is to go through scenarios basically. So this this table is pretty much like a matrix where 
you sort of say like, okay, I'll I'll set up a base case scenario. I'll select a number of shells based on the pit optimization outcome and the sensitivities from pit optimization. I'll say, here we go. These are four pits for this pit. You go through that exercise for all the pits, and then you set up a stockpiling of the material type, you know, sort of strategy for that particular base case, run the plan, then you come back later, they start refining from that. So you look at the outcome and you analyze that, you try and understand what is probably better in the context of achieving the product and in the context of maintaining consistency in achieving the product as well. So this is like, um, I can't remember the exact numbers, I might be wrong in the, um, the putting a number here, but I've put enough. <laughs> It's, it's a put three percentage as the difference between the base case and the the one the optimum solution that achieved for all these scenarios. Obviously, it looks simple. It is more like um, you're seeing that there are six scenarios, but it's way more than six scenarios. So each of them are different um, separate projects. Within each project, we have number we run like number of scenarios, like number of runs, maybe like 10, 20 runs each for each of them. Um, it depends again on the complexity of the project as well and the confidence level that you have on getting to that peak value of the optimized or peak NP value. Yeah, um, I touched on a lot of these things already, like um, project findings and outcome. Um, Price was the key driver. Obviously, we came up with a good product mix strategy, which the company is sort of like. Um, and then there was so there's obviously opportunity to improve on that. But um, and the other things from mining point of view is, um, you know, instead of going with one set of pushbacks and saying, here we go, this is the best pushback, this is the best sort of sequence for the whole operation, it's not that approach. You evaluated your operation options and then looked at different shapes, different sizes, you looked at the inventory, you understood the inventory. Uh, that that's all coming from coming as a part of this work. And then it's all backed by the numbers, it's backed by the spatial information. So there's confidence in saying that, okay, I'm gonna go with this particular option or as a robust mind plan for this particular project. Um, and other than that, there are like, obviously there'll be um, outcomes in terms of what you're doing with the, what's happening in terms of the physicals, what you're, the main question, how much uh, product you're producing, when you're starting to, when you're getting to the, um, full capacity of the mine, full capacity of the project, what sort of ramp up you're looking at, uh, what sort of mining fleet you're looking at, considering the mining being at like 150, 200, close to 200 million tons per annum. So what sort of, how many diggers, how many sort of trucks, how many, where you're focusing in the initial three years, where you're going in terms of the mining sequence. Um, obviously in the processing plant, um, each four hubs, um, so you, you're trying to say like, okay, these, this is these are the this is the plan for each hub. So in each of these plans, we're going to go for these plans, and that's the set cap capital for each of the plan. And then this is when the plan is getting started in terms of operation. Um, I think it's just just on that. Um, <coughs> apart from this, from this, usually you look at the uh, sensitivities as well. It's one thing that you do as a part of the pit optimization. Most people would, would do it at least to understand um, what it means if, you, if the price has come down by 10 percentage or gone up by 10 percentage is that potential to have a better plan than this uh, if the price has come down do we still have a project main questions um, not so relevant for mining mining cost is not such a big driver in my experience over the years but if you look at a gold project you would definitely want to do gold or like something like uranium platinum um, high strip ratio uh, mining cost up by 10 cents, your project is gone. So those are the things you, you will answer as a part of optimization, pit optimization. But then here we are, like you can use these runs and then run sensitivities on them. So that's another thing, but all right. Um, yeah, do you have any questions? Santosh, you said that uh, you did you were involved in a trade-off study for underground and open pit using mine max. Yeah. So my question is, did you do this? Is that a trade-off study which was done outside mine max, or the assessment was done inside mine? Max? No, it's it's not actually a trade-off study. So the context is like um, we were given a deposit, 
and uh, the first thing is to evaluate like what's the option with regard to open pit and underground both so both were open pretty much like you could either go open pit underground or you can have a combination so this project as it panned out we had the pit optimization results and we looked at it and we have we had the underground capability as well to look at this project as a complete underground operation so when we looked at it there was a particular elevation where the mining costs sort of spiked down and at that point it doesn't make sense to go further deep in terms of open pit mining so you would obviously try and explore potentially the underground mine right now was this assessment done by bringing underground schedule into mine max it's a locked in schedule okay so um, the, the concept is like a underground team worked on the underground part of the optimization and scheduling exercise. They did all the MSOs coming up with the right shape, right sort of SMU, dilution and everything. And then they gave us a few options. So three multiple options based on the based on the throughput they are targeting. Like in underground, I don't know, I don't have a lot of experience in that. But essentially it, it is like it is to say that with underground I'm going to produce, I have three options. If I go for like a million tons per annum of production, this is how the flat out, this is how the mine is going to look like. And if I increase it, then this is how it is going to look like. It might be slightly at the cost of it, you know, increased capex, opex, or whatever it might be, or increased dilution, right? So you, you have a few scenarios that you can look at from underground perspective. Again, having said that, it's not fixed. So as a part of the evaluation, we took in all those scenarios. And then we plugged in the open pit inventory for each of those scenarios. So if you if you visualize this, like if you have three underground scenarios, you would have three mine max projects. So underground schedule plugged in as a as a locked in schedule um, month by month. I think it is quarterly. And then there was a trigger point where uh, you have to spend some capital to start the underground mine. So the open pit being flexible around that. So you could do whatever you can practically, whatever is practically achievable. Um, you, even then, this, you sort of have to consider the capital as well, capital implication on the combined project. So put it this way, like, um, so this project had a stage one from where you could um, access the underground mine, but you, to, you, to get access to the underground mine, you still need to spend some time, right? You don't get to access to the whole straight away. It might be one year, one and a half years, or whatever it could be. So all that is capital in a way. So when, you, when you're deciding on the timing, then you want to understand how much you have to spend to get access to the O to start generating revenue. So that point it becomes a revenue generating operation. Until that point, it's only capital for you. So you, if you plug it in, and if the software has the ability to uh, follow the logged in sequence quarter by quarter, and then say, okay, open pit is supplementing or underground is supplementing the open pit production, then you can maybe like it. From that point on, it's all it's only about tweaking what you can do in open pit. You can change things here and there a little bit within the practicality limits. You have like you may have like sink rate, you know, limits on open pit, which you can't exceed. Um, if it is on the single pit, you can only do as much as you can do based on the practicality constraints. So um that's the goal. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no, uh, no, my my what I wanted to understand was is this economic evaluations done in uh, mind max? It is, it was done in mind max. Okay. So that, that's, that's why, yes, yeah, so the only part is underground is used as bench inventory in, a open, in mind max. Yes. So you can trick it to use it in a specific way. Yeah. Either you can pull it in as a, a single, you know, hun, multi, hundreds of fixed inventories, each of the quarters you're treating them as picks, and then go and, and, and then present mind max with the waste tons, O tons, and the associated you know, revenue generating elements, gold or whatever. So each of them can become pits, hundreds of pits, or it can go with them as a stage. Within the stage, you can treat them as benches if you go into the technical aspect of it. Essentially, the idea is to lock the underground schedule, not do anything to anything with the underground schedule. Exactly lock it, you are only deciding when I want to bring in the underground operation into picture. Do I, do I sort of, Delayed or should I bring it in early? And what do I? How do I sort of, uh, you know, uh, play with the open bid in terms of matching the supplementing the overall project? Even the no Thanks.
So I just wanted to clarify, um, I think you had a slide with the matrix there before. Yeah, so from a stockpiling scenario, are you saying you did one project file and you had ran 10 scenarios limiting your stockpile size as well as the pushback and then you no, basically um, had nine projects? It is nine projects, yeah. yeah. So you start with the base case, you go through a bit of optimization, run through your an exercise of selecting which shells, and then you say you look at the greater niche those in each of the hubs, and you say, okay, this is the best sort of raw mat raw match to the material types for this hub. For this hub, we tweak it a little bit, and it's more alumina, higher alumina. So you tweak the the stockpiles. You come up with a plan initially. That becomes your base case. Once you run that, you get a number, and then you get a feeling for the deposit, what it is doing in terms of the product, and you, you do have, you have to do a bit of analysis of the outcome. It is not just to say that you push one button and get the answer. You look at the outcome, you come back, and then you look at the pit inventories again from pit optimization results. Then you start picking the sizes for each of the, given that you have 80 odd pits, you can like size it in any way. So sometimes the pits are like only maybe like five meters apart in terms of wall difference, but it can make worlds of difference. So those things like, it may, it may not be as you know, you know as sort of uh, sensitive, but it will still be sensitive. Like in most cases, if you do this exercise completely, at least with a few set of pushback scenarios, you would inevitably sort of get at least two to three percentage better NPV. In my experience, this is my experience. What you are describing there almost seems like. Um, doing a pit optimization and schedule down to the block level, so something like your standard blazer or Deswick Go, is that accurate? No, that's something that MindMax, I think, uh, has a lot of catching up to do in that sense. Uh, yes, sorry, yeah, this is completely different. Like, uh, so that's a different concept. That's like you, you're representing the entire block model and you're presenting the slope and everything within the block model, and then you're trying to say, like, to mine this block, I have to go like mine two blocks on either side, and obviously the one above that, all those rules, and then it generates the shells for you. There's no shell generation. It's pretty much knows where to start mining. There are a few tools like uh, they're, they're not commercially available in the market, um, but they're not quite there. Some of them are there, but uh, there's a lot of uh, work to be done in that area. It is good in a way because it's integrated in that sense. Um, you don't have to go through this exercise of creating multiple pushback scenarios and hoping that you're a good engineer, you've done the best selection for the pushbacks. But um, I would rather do that. Like if I had the option, like I would uh, start from the blocks and then try the generation of shells based on the actual schedule. But it's a lot of power, it's a sort of power intensive process, I would say. We need to get there in terms of you know, capability with CPLEX and even improving capability on CPLEX. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.